This follows on from the last screencast, which was introduction to health determinants. So the factors that influence health. And I said this is Dahlgren and Whitehead's um, seminal um, work, really, trying to explore the range of factors that influence um, people's health and well-being. Just remember that when you're doing your assessments, that obviously we're looking at children's health and well-being. But a lot of the literature talks about health and well being talks about health and well being generally and determinants of health generally. So if it's slightly unclear on the slide, um, what you can do is, is if you just put it into Google and images, you'll see um, this model is replicated. It's it's a, a very, very well known model. So in the first section here, in the red. Essentially, they're um, the factors that cannot be changed. So the things that are immutable. So genetics. So if you're thinking about this is all about the factors that, that influence health, as is health determinants. So if you've got a ge genetic predisposition to a certain um, condition, then you know you have a genetic predisposition. Obviously, there's there's things that you get, you can do, um, but you can't change that genetic predisposition. The same with the age, you can't change your age, obviously. Um, at certain ages, you'll have different vulnerabilities. Sex is another one. Um, men and women have differences, for example, um, different liver sizes. Um, they have differences in terms of very obvious ones. Women can't have, get prostate cancer, men can't get ovarian cancer. So there are oh, vulnerabilities that are due to factors. Um, that cannot be changed. So I'm not going to particularly talk about those in this module at all. I'm really interested in, in the things that can be changed. So the next layer that we can see is individual lifestyle factors. And when we talk about individual lifestyle factors, what we're talking about are things such as the foods that people eat, whether they smoke or don't smoke, whether they take drugs or don't take drugs, whether they exercise or don't, the level of stress that they're, that they're under. Now, you can see what I'm starting to say, particularly with the latter point about the stress, is you might be thinking, well, hmm, how much is um, the stress that someone under to do with a lifestyle? factors or how much is it to do with things that they haven't got any control over okay the same with drugs and alcohol we'll come to that um, with the food you eat how much of those is actually do we have control over <clears throat> so I'm going to come to that but that's certainly the next stage so we're the first one is the things that can't be changed and then individual lifestyle factors can be changed the next one is social and community networks. And the way that that influences our help is about thinking about connectivity. And we do know, and it's something that, that has become much more talked about, and interestingly, significantly talked about during the pandemic. And one of the things people spoke about was, was isolation and the negative impact of isolation. And connectivity is really important and has been shown to be really important for health, for, for um, positive health and well-being. So the social and community networks is how how connected is someone to their local community? Are they far part of a community, whether that's a, a geographical community, um, a religious um, community or, or, or whatever kind that is? So do they, have they got support in that community? Are there, are there um, parks available? Have they got good positive friends, friendships and, and family support? So even though someone might be going through um, a, a difficult experience, maybe someone's um, experiencing mental health difficulties, if they've got good social and community networks, it can really mitigate against that, can really lessen the impact. Again, it can be changeable. If we move into the green area, what we can see is we can start to see some broader areas. So I'm not going to go through 
every single one of these, but I'll, I will discuss some of those. So if we're looking at general socio-economic, cultural, environmental conditions, let's, let's have a think about it. So if we think about housing, for example, the type of housing that you're in, you know, influences health. Well, how? Well, what we do know is that if someone's living in housing which has got damp, then that's really poor for respiratory health, really poor for um, asthma and other conditions. It's also very poor for mental well-being. Um, if we're thinking about, obviously, access to water and sanitation, access to healthcare services, unemployment, so unemployment is a, is here as a factor because only for two reasons, for two areas really. One is about the emotional impact of unemployment, the impact on someone's well-being, on their self-esteem, on their sense of self. It's also the financial impact of unemployment, particularly longer term unemployment where people's ability to save for a rainy day, there just isn't the financial help there being able to um, being able to have a reasonable standard of living. So the work environment, what sort of work environment someone does influences their health and well-being. Do they have any autonomy? And again, autonomy is something that's really important and has been cited time and time again in relationship to um, well-being in relationship to how people feel about how much control they have over their job. Are they told that they have to do with this? They have to go there. They have to start. They have to cover these tasks. Do they have any control when they have a break? Um, are they on a zero hours contract where they feel, maybe feel obliged to um, work whenever they're offered hours in case they're penalised um, by you know, in the future by loss of hours. Is it a physically dangerous job? You know, are they, are they doing something which is potentially harmful to their physical health? Are they doing something which is harmful to their mental health? And, and although we're talking in this module about children and young people, inevitably these factors influence um, the, the if we're talking about work environment, if a parent is particularly stressed by work or they're on a very low pay and they're having to work very long hours, inevitably that influences um, children and young people's health and well-being. You know, attitudes, if we're thinking about um, cultural attitudes, things for such example as racism, Islamophobia, sexism or homophobia, the, these make a difference. Um, to people's health and well-being. If we're thinking about austerity and the um, cuts, huge cuts that they've been in in public expenditure, so cuts that they've been in things such as sure start centres, um, cuts that they've been for people who are working generally in the public sector, especially youth work's been decimated. All these have an impact on people's um, health and well-being. Access to um, drug and alcohol services that would come under here under healthcare services, but also the conditions that um, that that mean that people are more likely to take drugs and alcohol as well come into this. So what I would like you just to think about is when you think about ways that we can improve um, children, young people's health, indeed anybody's health, what are the fact, what are the, the things that first come to your mind? Are they things around um, individual lifestyle factors saying, you know, advising people that they should eat healthier food, stop smoking, drink less, or are they on here or are they a bit of both and think about how much do you think individual lifestyle factors are the most important and I'm going to move on in the next screencast to 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 talk about that very issue about where where should we be focusing our attention and what are the most important factors thank you